meditating on Easter, I'm not going to lie to you, church, there was such a heaviness that filled my heart throughout these past weeks. I think we can all agree that the events of the past year and even the last couple of months have been discouraging. The continuing battle of social injustice being fought in our midst, the oppression of the black, indigenous, Asian community, and many other people of color being exposed. People are losing their jobs. People being displaced from their homes. The economy is just be, being con turned completely upside down. The pandemic that was supposed to last a couple of weeks has now anniversary. Families and friends haven't been able to hug or spend quality time together. Can I just high five a stranger, <laughs> please? <laughs> Depression, mental health have become much more prevalent. Church, my heart has been so heavy. There's just been so much bad news. And I've been praying and praying, you know, and thinking about Easter, and it's been on my mind so much because, friends, we need a Savior. We need hope. We need some good news. We need Jesus. So shake someone in your household, someone beside you, write it in the chat. We need Jesus. We need hope. We need Jesus. And I'm so glad we're spending the time to focus on him because we need him. We need to know him. There's more to this life than we're living right now. And if your heart is heavy like mine with, with the bad news, I want to tell you today that I have good news. There is an eternity. There is a paradise where COVID does not exist. There is a place where there is no injustice. There is a place that is promised to us. You know, I'm not saying ignore the issues of the world. Church, I, I believe that we should be at the forefront. We should be involved in these issues. I'm just saying, church, lift up your head. There is hope for eternity with Christ. What we're experiencing right now isn't the end of the story. It's far from the end. It's not even close. So if you feel like it's the end of your story, I want to tell you today, it's not the end of the story. And thank God that we have a way to get there. And that way is through Jesus. So today we are declaring that Jesus is the only way. I want to take this moment to comfort you. I know there are so many issues. I know there's evil and chaos and destruction everywhere you look. But I know someone who is the way, the truth, and the life. Someone who will make a way when there seems to be no way. Someone who owns the riches of this world and can provide. Someone who knows the depth of your grief and sorrow. Who knows you and loves you. He is all-knowing deeply loving, merciful, he's gracious, and just. I know the issues are complex, but I know even the wisest of men are foolish to him. He's the only one who can change the heart of man. He's the only one who can change our behavior. And I don't know the answer, but I know he who holds the answer, and his name is Jesus. So today, I pray that your spirit would be comforted. Jesus is our hope. Jesus is for you. He is the way. Say something to somebody beside you. Shake yourself. He is the way. And our main passage today in John 14, 6 to 7, let's turn our Bibles there. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus tells this to his disciples as he prepares them for what is next to come. Many of the disciples were walking with Jesus and, and wondering what was going to happen next. And to set the stage and give a little context, we see this intimate setting in, in, in the, the book of John. 
where Jesus, after supper, he gets up and he, he washes the feet of the disciples. And from John 13 to 17, we see Jesus teaching his disciples, comforting them. He talks about, you know, the command to love one another. He talks about the gift of the Holy Spirit, abiding in him, the promise for greater works, perfecting joy and love. He talks about persecution, and, and it's in this, these conversations that he talks and he comforts the disciples and reveals to them that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. So let's dig into the, the word today and declare the truth. And the first truth that we're studying is that Jesus is the only way to eternal life. At the beginning of John 14, from verses 1 to 4, we learn that Jesus is the only way to eternity. Let's turn our Bibles there. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. In verse 2, Jesus describes heaven as a house with many rooms. And that he goes before us and he prepares a place for us. And he brings us this, up this promise of eternal life as a way to comfort his disciples. You know, it's a way to tell them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. Believe in the Father. And be comforted in the fact that there is an eternity. So I want to tell you, church, today, and bring it to the presence to say, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the Father. And have hope in eternity. You know, we need to keep on focusing on eternity. You know, focusing and believing in Jesus. You know, we need to believe that he goes before us and he prepares a place for us. Because this world is temporary. It's fleeting. That's why the Bible says that we're not from this world in Philippians 3, 20 to 21, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies, amen, so that they will be like his glorious body. You see, church, we are given hope that there will be a place where there's no suffering. Friends, there is an overwhelming sense of peace. There's great hope when I look around me and I know that what is happening is only temporary. I can live with joy knowing that my future is secure, that Jesus is preparing a place for me in eternity. Do not be fooled, though. Jesus makes it clear that he is the only way to eternity and that through personal belief and relationship with him, he is what gives us access to eternal life. No other name can save but Jesus. You know, works won't do it. Being a good person, it isn't enough. Only through Jesus do we have eternal life. He's the only one who can reconcile us to the Father. He's the only one who could just take our sin and bear it on the cross, justify us. We're not worthy of eternal life. We're not worthy. But it's Jesus that saves us. It's Jesus who reconciles us. In John 3, 16 to 18, a famous passage, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I want to encourage you today, the promise of eternity is for you. And it's accessible through Jesus. He took our sin upon himself. He paid the price. He overcame death and was raised to life that we may live in eternity. We need to ask ourselves as a church, how much emphasis do we place on eternity? How much do we think of what's next? 
Is this all there really is to life? How much importance are we putting on this world rather than eternal things? My prayer is that the promise and hope of eternity would wash over us today and bring us peace and hope, especially in the current state that we live in. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. He is also, the, the other truth is he is the only way to the Father. In John 14, 6 to 7, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do knew, know him and have seen him. Reading this verse, we see two things. One is that we have access to the Father through Jesus. It says clearly, no one comes to the Father except through him. And the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross allows us as sinners to freely come to the Father. He is our advocate. He makes us worthy. In 1 John 2, 1 to 2, it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. He is the atoning sacrifice. He is the one that caused the veil to torn in two from the presence of the Lord, so that we can access the presence of the Lord. In the Old Testament, the temple was set up so that there was no access to the Holy of Holies. There was a veil that separated man from the presence of God. And praise God that on the cross 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on that cross, it says, hallelujah, in Matthew 27, verse 51, it says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And the place, the presence of God that was unaccessible to, to man was torn in two. Amen. The veil was torn and we were given complete access to his presence. As, as, as unholy as I am, as full of sin as I am, I can come to the Father freely. You, church, have access to the Father and his presence. You know, say that, I have access to the Father. So thank God for that access, especially in this pandemic. I think this pandemic really shook us and rattled our traditional approaches to the presence of God. You know, some of us have gone our whole Christian life experiencing the presence of God only in this building, only in large gatherings. You know, some of us went our whole walk this way. Whether it be conferences, encounters, most of our experience with the presence of God was linked to this building. And we've gone little over a year now with this building closed. But friends, the doors to the building have closed, but the doors to the presence of God have never been shut. Amen? You know, I felt his presence in my home. I felt his presence with my family. If you're home watching right now, I'm sure you feel his presence too. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God that we can access that presence freely, that he is the advocate, that he draws near to us as we draw near to him, as we have that full access to the Father through Jesus. We also are able to know the Father well through knowing Jesus. There's so much power in God becoming flesh and demonstrating who he is as a man. To have the life of Jesus on record and display. For us to see the characteristics of God manifest in the world. To see God move in the flesh. To be like you and me. To see his response. God made into man. John 14, 9 to 10. Let's turn there. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus was telling Philip 
When we know Jesus, we know the Father. You see, friends, when I, I see the compassion of the Father, when I see Jesus stand up for that adulterous woman, I see the Father's inclusion and love when I see Jesus have a moment with that Samaritan woman. I see the, the Father's power when I see Jesus perform signs and wonders, turning water into wine, feeding of the 5,000, healing the blind and the lame. I see the Father's humility as Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. I see the Father's emotions as I see Jesus weep over Lazarus. I see the Father's boldness as Jesus stands for truth, as he stands for what is right and does not tolerate it. I see Jesus' response. I see Jesus' actions. And I begin to know more about the Father. I begin to know the Father well. My mind, my human mind is able to comprehend the characteristics of God when I see Jesus moving. Church, if you want to know the Father well, you need to know Jesus. You need to study the Word. You need to look at His life so that it could breathe over you, so that we can know who the Father truly is, so that you know, we would understand, we would comprehend the characteristics of the Father. Apostle Paul knew that Je knowing Jesus was the most important thing. Philippians 3, 7 to 8, it says, But whatever were gains to me now, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. You see, Paul knew that, that knowing Jesus was the most important. He knew the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Knowing him is the priority. It is the most important. It should be at the top of our list. Because, friends, there are a lot of people that agree that Jesus existed. There are a lot of them who know the name of Jesus. He's a popular guy. But there are not many who know him well and know him intimately. It's in those moments of knowing him well and knowing him intimately that we understand that he is God, that we begin to understand his will. We get to understand his kingdom. And we begin to understand that he satisfies our every need, that Jesus is truly enough. So I challenged myself, and I was, I was meditating and praying with God, and and I, I began to ask myself, if knowing Jesus is the most important, where do I stand? You know, we've been putting so much emphasis on Jesus, but have I lost my focus? Have I lost my way? Have I lost sight of Jesus? And today we're just going to go over a few hindrances of what that looks like. I want to ask you, church, have you ever lost your way? You know, in the physical, you know, we use GPS all the time. We use Google Maps or Waze. And have you ever gotten lost? Or am I the only one? I want to tell you it's the most frustrating thing ever. Unless you're a super Christian, there are two things that happen. First is that you lose your peace because you have no clue where you are. You just don't know what's happening. You're, you're completely turned upside down. And the second is that you waste your time and resources. You know, Waze or Google Maps, it tells you your destination is five minutes away. And then the five minutes comes and your destination is still five minutes away. And the time keeps adding and adding and adding, and then you lose your data, and then you're, you don't know what's happening. It tells you to keep making turns. And what happens is you waste your gas, you waste your energy, and in those moments, your marriage is either strengthened <laughs> or is completely crushed. <laughs> you see, there are real disadvantages to being lost. There are real disadvantages of going the wrong way. You know, if we live our lives on the wrong path, 
missing Jesus and losing sight of Jesus, there's just never enough. There's never the right job. There's never the right amount of money. We're just going in circles, in circles. We're wasting our time, our energy, on things that end up being a dead end. You might be here today saying, Paul, I'm a Christian. I'm on the right path. I'm here to remind you, church, even as Christians, it's easy to lose sight of Jesus. It's easy to lose focus of Jesus. How many of us have an intimate relationship with him? There are many that believe he exists, but it's only through intimate relationship and the study of the word that we know he's the truth, he's the life, and he is the only way. You know, I grew up in the church. Um, I would say I've given my whole life to serving God. You know, my dad would bring us here all the time, and I'm sure all of you have seen me grow up. I got saved at a young age, and, and all I wanted to do was serve God. I knew serving God was what I wanted to do. It was the right thing to do. And I think I've been a part of almost every ministry here at CLC. I spent all my free time serving God. And it was a good thing. And I don't regret any of it. But it's a good thing until it replaces the main thing. And there's so many moments in my life where I'd have to ask myself, you know, be feeling empty. And I have to check in and be honest with myself. Have I lost sight of Jesus? Have I lost focus on the main thing? Yes, I was living for Jesus, but was I living with him? And in a famous passage, Luke 10, 40 to 42, Martha and Mary in their interaction with, Je interaction with Jesus, let's turn there. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha. That's, that's how I read Jesus' response to Martha. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. How much priority do we place on knowing him? You know, the benefits of salvation, the spiritual gifts, the blessings, has that been the focus of our attention? Have we been striving so hard that we miss the key thing of loving Jesus? Have we got it twisted where we focus on the benefits where we miss the person when in fact when you focus on the person, you get the benefits? The fruit of abiding in him. You see, knowing Jesus, believing in him, loving him, keeping his commands, that's the journey. And when I think about Waze and Google Maps, all of us know how it works. You know, you have your destination, you plot where you want to go. You know, you, let's say, I'm going to go to CLC. I plot that in. I pop it in, boop, 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 boop. And it gives me two things. It gives me the path, or it gives me the summary of the steps. And I'm pretty sure all of us here use this for everything. I use it, you know, if I want to check the time, how long it's going to take. I use it if, you know, I'm going to be stuck in traffic. I use it if I forgot how to get my friend's house because it's been a pandemic and I haven't been there for a year and a half. But there's so many reasons why we use it, right? And, and you plot it in, you put it in, it gives you a thing, and then you can click the summary of steps, right? So let's bring this back to where we are today. You know, we are here, and the destination is eternity. And I put my peg on the house with many rooms. I'm putting my peg on the biggest room with the biggest king-size bed and all the amenities. I'm putting my destination there. I don't know where you guys are putting your destination. I'm putting my destination there. Do, 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 I calculate the steps. Okay? And I look at the summary of the steps. And when I look at the summary of the steps, there's only one thing there, and that's to know Jesus and love Jesus. You see, friends, when I say he's the way, he is the way. It's that simple, but it's that complex. You know, he's the way. 
He is the way. Jesus is the way to eternity. And he is enough. So practically, you know, what's stopping us? What's hindering us? I'm going to go over this quickly, and I want us to really dig deep into this, really ask ourselves, especially approaching Easter, what's hindering us from knowing Jesus well? And the first is shame. You know, there's moments in our lives where we stumble into sin. You know, the enemy, he gets in our heads, and we're filled with shame. You know, we're ashamed of what we've done, and we choose to not turn to the Lord because of fear of judgment and All of you know that I have a two-year-old named Harper. And if you've had a toddler before, uh, praise God for you. Um, (laughs) This is the age, and all of you parents can attest to this, this is the age where God decides to download all of the emotions into this little body (laughs) all at once. And he probably does this to level you up as parents, right? You know, you, you finish taking care of the baby. The baby is alive. We did it. And then all of a sudden, there's this little human here with all the emotions, and it's, God's now saying, okay, now you have to parent them. <laughs> and that's, that's where the biggest, the biggest, the most energy and, and the hardest part is. And, you know, I look at Harper, and because we love her, we're, we're starting to discipline her. And I look at her when we discipline her and correct her, and and a rule in our house is you can't throw food at people. I think that's a rule. (laughs) And any any house, I think that's a good rule. So when Harper throws food maybe at me, I say, Harper, you do not throw. And instantly, you see her face. You know, it just, you know, it just turns sad and... And she begins to turn her body like this. She turns away from me. Instantly, you can see the shame just fill her. You know, and, and it's in those moments as a father, yeah, I want to correct her. I want her to know what's right. But the last thing I want her to do is turn away from me. I want her to know that I love her and that we're in this together. And friends, shame comes. This is my toddler who's been isolated for (laughs) how long no societal you know pressures or anything like that just naturally she feels ashamed of what she's done and we feel the same shame when we sin against the father and jesus and it's in those moments the last thing he wants you to do is turn away from him jesus said in mark 2 17 When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So I want to talk to you today. Those of you who feel like a sinner, Jesus came for sinners. I want to tell, talk to those who are struggling with addiction today, that Jesus cares for you. Those who are in a cycle of sinning and, and feel so much shame, I want to talk to you today and that, say that Jesus doesn't want you to turn your head away from him, but rather he invites you into personal relationship with him. He came for you. He is the way for you. So I want to encourage you, those who don't feel loved, you are loved. Jesus loves you. The next hindrance is busyness. It's one of the main contributors of us focusing on Jesus, losing focus. Most of the time, our, our, our lives and schedule become so full of responsibilities. You know, we have the career, check, family, relationships, personal growth, our health. We got to rest sometime. And a lot of the time, Jesus gets the leftover, if any time in the day. You know, even as Christians, sometimes we get so busy, serve, 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 that there's this lack of prayer, lack of devotion. You know, (laughs) and I'm saying this from a place of conviction, but Jesus, you know, sometimes he gets the time where you you lay down in your bed, and you're like, I'm going to have a great moment with the Lord at the end of the day. 
and you pick up your Bible, and <laughs> you speak to me in my dreams, Lord. <laughs> Sometimes that's all the time you get. Friends, any relationship needs quality time. Any relationship, relationship with your spouse, relationship with your kids, even your relationship with your dog needs quality time. You need to invest time in order for it to grow. There are no shortcuts to knowing Jesus well. And he calls us out of our busyness in Matthew 22, 37 to 38. It says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. There are a lot of important commandments out there. But this is the first and the greatest. And I want to put emphasis here on the first and the greatest. Sometimes we just skim over this. But I want to tell you, loving God is the first and the greatest. There are a lot of tasks to do out there. But I want to encourage you, church, that that loving and knowing God should be the first and greatest. It is the most important. And Stephen R. Covey, the author of the book of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he said this, most of us spend too much time on what is urgent and not enough time on what is important. I say that again. Most of us spend too much time on what is urgent and not enough time on what is important. And this is so true when I read this and I was doing deep reflection because there's a lot of tasks to do in the day. You know, most of the time we operate based on priority or, or urgency, right? Things come up, our day is consumed with putting, up, putting out these little fires, whether it be your kids, your spouse, uh, you need to do this chore, this in your career, the challenges of every day, I know. But if I know in my heart that making time for my wife is important, I'm going to make time. If I know in my heart that spending time with my kids is important, I'm going to make time. You see, it's the same with the Lord. If we believe that knowing Jesus is the most important, we just need to make time. No matter what, it's the meeting that I will always show up for. And it's something that we need to build up and we need to discipline ourselves to do. And that's why I, I kept repeating that it's the first and greatest. Because we need to keep reminding ourselves every day when we see the list of things to do, that loving God is the first and greatest. So write that in the chat. Shake your neighbor beside you. Say, I will make time for Jesus. The next two is, uh, I'm going to go over these quickly. The next one is disobedience. A personal relationship and partnership with Jesus should be filled with faithfulness and obedience to Christ and following his word. We lose our way when Jesus pulls us one way and we want to go the other way. <laughs> you know, he's pulling us this direction, but we're going this direction. And this disobedience creates this distance between us. And we lose the intimacy with the Lord. You know, God disciplines those that he loves. And we can't let the word that corrects us deter us from knowing him. You see, we're the most connected with the Lord when we're going his way. We can't be going two separate ways. You know, we need to align ourselves to him. And when there's a word that he says, that we need to follow it. In John 15, 10, it says... If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. And lastly, the, the final hindrance is persecution. It's hard to have a flourishing relationship with Christ when you get persecuted for your faith, and then we decide to hide it. Church, a secret relationship will not thrive. Hiding our relationship with Jesus and not fully embracing it because we are afraid of what others might say will make it hard for the relationship to flourish. It will be hard for Jesus to show you his great love for you, to demonstrate his power in your life if he's a secret. A secret relationship is unhealthy in all regards. 
In 1 Peter 4, 14 and 16, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and, uh, and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal, criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. We live in a time today where there will be persecution. You know, Jesus told his disciples, I was persecuted, so you're going to be persecuted too. There will be a lot of questions. There will be a lot of people challenging our faith. And those times, we can't shrink back as Christians, but we need to be faithful to Jesus. We need to develop that relationship where we continue to choose Jesus over popularity. You know, be proud that you have faith. Be proud of Jesus. Amen. You know, be proud that you have a, a true love. Be proud that you know the way. Share your relationship with Jesus to others. You know, don't shrink back, especially this Easter. Be proud. Be proud that you know the way. Be proud to share the way to eternity. Because, friends, the world needs to know. Amen. The world needs to know. So the, these hindrances are, are only a few hindrances, but there are so many that cause us, you know, to, to not know Jesus well. And as I close, I, I want to remind you that there is no other way but through him, Jesus. There is no shortcut. Again, good works won't cut it. Good morals, eating healthy, won't cut it. So if you are searching today, I want to tell you to stop. Accept that Jesus is the only way. And follow him. Stop going in circles. Stop wasting time and resources, especially now. Follow Jesus. And for those of you who are joining us today and may not know Jesus, and you may not know who we're talking about today, I want to tell you that he loves you. He sent his son Jesus to take your place, take your sin, and to nail it on the cross. In three days he rose again, overcame death, and he's alive and, and resurrected and living today, and he wants to have a relationship with you. He's the only way to eternity, the only way to the Father, and he wants to be in your life. No matter what you've done, I want to tell you that he's a father that doesn't want you to turn your head away from him, but towards him. He's the only one who can satisfy your need, and he is enough. So I want to invite you in a prayer, a simple prayer of, of acceptance to Jesus, and it's also a prayer of reded rededication to Jesus. For those of you who, who have lost focus, that we can be, recommit to knowing Jesus well. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we believe that you took our sin, that we are sinners and that we need you. And that, Lord, you sent your son, Jesus, to take the sins of the world and to die for us, to put it on that cross that we may be made clean. Lord, we believe that you rose from the dead in three days and that you're living it resurrected in heaven and father we just invite you in a personal relationship lord jesus with us we just accept who you are and god we rededicate our lives to you we ask god that you take away any hindrance that causes us to not know you well lord that we would focus on you that we would love you and know you we bless you lord in jesus mighty name amen Hello Champions, we are thankful you have chosen to join us today here at Champion Life Center Church Online. We were blessed and honored that you have chosen to worship with us today and we pray that you felt welcome and loved and that your worship experience was one that was engaging, uplifting, and fulfilling. If you have committed your life to Christ today, Please send us a note by visiting our website at championlife.ca and select contact. Send your feedback and prayer requests or call us by phone 
And remember, you can give your tithes and your offerings through our website, text to give, use the Champion Life Center app, or e-transfer your giving. Just make sure to select the location that you are giving to. Thank you so much for your continued support and may the Lord bless you as always. Feel free to share this broadcast with your friends, with your loved ones, and with your family. Please hang out with us now in our Connect Lounge right after service online. Lastly, don't forget to follow us on our social media pages. This is the best way to stay updated with everything that's going on here at Champion Life Center and engage with our Champion Life community. And of course, we want to stay connected with you. Let us know how we can be praying for you. And again, we are so glad that you have joined us. We hope to see you online next Sunday. Stay safe, rejoice, and be blessed.